how many of you uh, think you know something about the Internet of Things? So I've got an intelligent audience, yes? Well, you all went, ooh, so maybe. Okay, how many people are working on something for the Internet of Things? Even better. Okay, so we're going to talk about quite a lot about reality. Now, this presentation is going to use the first few slides to set um, a little bit of background on the subject and what's happening. And then I want to get into some real examples of how these things are actually developing and working. So I'm going to assume that you will read the slide behind me, and I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, is that OK? Can we agree on that? Yeah, come on. We're a bit of audience participation. Yeah. OK. The, the simple reality is that we talked earlier today in that very impressive opening uh, keynote about content, and we talked about people, social graph, etc. The adding part to this is things, devices, machine to machine, whatever you like to think of it as. And the reality of this one, and I use reality rather than some of the predictions I've seen about the market size, is that it's happening because chips are getting cheaper, their power requirements are going down, so it's very easy now to have uh, embedded intelligence into almost anything. I think when we get to the stage that you're supposed to have toothbrushes now that connect, that probably is about as far as it's going to go. We're also acutely aware now of the value of connectivity. Um, probably the cloud has done more than any other single thing to produce the mindset of connectivity equals value. And therefore, one way or another, we are all Internet of Things users. Um, I presume at least some of you use Uber. Yeah? No? Not making money out of you lot, are they? Um, Uber is an example of an Internet of Things smart service. It knows where you are. It knows where the cab is. It knows all of that information to do a real-time process. So every day now, we're all using smart services. And so our connectivity model is the Internet of Everything. So what we're adding to this model is things. And what we're trying to do is value, use data to kick out valuable processes. So something happens, something that we couldn't have done before. And that means that it is all about relationships. So quite simply, whether we put up a, a relationship or a diagram of IoT or a diagram of graph, the pictorial representations look pretty much the same. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, this particular building, I happen to know, is not a smart building. Um, but I can give you a good example of one in Amsterdam called The Edge, which is Deloitte's head office locally. And I can tell you there are 22,000 IoT devices in that building, data points, if you like, in that building. Now, if you imagine that model for a moment, the relationships between 22,000 things are never mapped. You, you wouldn't do it, would you? You wouldn't write down and detail how every single thing is connected to everything else. This is not client-server. Think about what would happen if this room one sensor reported the room was getting colder. What would go with that is a chain reaction of why could it be getting colder? Is the uh, cooling and heating system not coming on? Has someone left the doors open? Are there more um, lights? Have the lights been turned down? A source of heat? How many people are in the room? What you've got is a lot of little pinpricks which have something to say about that condition. The events. Strings and strings of events. So you'll not be surprised to know that you have a very similar model. It looks very much the same. And of course, you'll not be surprised to know that that doesn't really figure terribly well in any form of conventional great database, but it does figure very well in a graph database. So it is another further market disruption. Um, we hear all the numbers. We hear the talk. But actually, it's already happening if we start talking about Uber, if we start talking about Hive at home. Um, I presume some of you at least have got Hive or Nest or something running your home heating. Yes? No? You don't? Um, no? Okay. I can't tell you the joke now that says I argue with my wife over the temperature at home remotely. 
Okay, yeah, now I know who's using Hive. <laughs> okay, so you can get the point. The other way of looking at it is to say some of this is not new. Industrial operational automation has been going on for some time. So you've actually got a slightly challenging situation. People think they know what it's about. They're coming from one direction or another. The reality of this is that it's about the kind of data we haven't had before, and we want to use it in a kind of way that we haven't had to do that before. So this is where we start to get a bit more serious now and start thinking about what the hell's going on. So we're going to talk for a few moments about smart cities. Now, smart cities are a wonderful theory which isn't working terribly well because city authorities expo imposing stuff top down doesn't work half as well as smart services coming up. But let's try for one that I hope at least some of you are using, City Mapper. Yeah? Recognize it? Yeah, good. I've got some, some replies this time. We're getting better. Okay, City Mapper. Why do you use City Mapper? Because for you as a person, it works really well. Get me somewhere, tell me the route. Now turn the argument on its head and say, what powers that? Well, they have to get all the information from the city authorities. Now reverse it and say, what would the city authorities get back? They would know who asked what question about where to go from one point to another. And if they're really smart, there might even be a correlation between other sensors that said, did you choose to get on the bus or what else did you do? Does that make sense? So the smart city should be responding. If we change that into a car park and you say, I want a car park near the QE2 hall, then in doing that, we understand where you're coming from because that also pulls up the routing algorithm. We understand if there's free bays in the car park, which are a dynamic, which are constantly changing. We understand traffic flows are constantly changing. So during the process of your journey, you may have the route changed because of traffic, or you may have the destination changed because all those parking slots that were available are full. All right, that's a smart city. The smart bit is, if you think of the data that would come out of that, that's where the city authorities have to start th thinking differently. You've now got data about things that didn't happen. You'll know whether someone abandoned the journey because they couldn't get to the destination, they decided it wasn't worth the aggro. You'll know how many first choices for parking didn't happen. You'll know where people came from, etc. So you can now decide on something. If you really want to run real time, you can decide, do I start to change the traffic flow pattern? Do I start to adjust traffic lights? There's an event on. That's meaning the traffic's going up in that area. Shall I change it? So now we've got a city that's reacting. And we've also got a lot of data of a type we never had before. And it doesn't look like the kind of stuff where we did the same kind of analysis. Does that make sense? Right, okay. For some of you, did that make sense? <laughs> okay, right. So now do you get the link? It doesn't produce the same kind of data. It doesn't work in the same kind of way. And therefore, if you're in IoT startup land, and I hope some of those hands that went up, graph looks very, very attractive. It also suffers from the same problems that I'm sure you get back home at the ranch, which is not enough people know it or recognize it or understand the new world. Does that also sound recognizable? Yeah. And that is one of the big problems. So we're now going to talk about a couple of the other issues that go with this. Um, you've heard a lot about Watson from IBM, I'm sure. I understand they're out there talking about it. Um, and maybe one or two other things. The big part of IoT that matters is what you do with the data. And that's complex event processing. Now, some of you will have met this before, but here is an example around a car just to get the point across of why we do it differently and what is different. Um, a car, if you buy one today, thin, and thin end of the market, 150 sensing points on board, most of them about 200. 
move it up to um, the new Mercedes E or the BMW 7, and you're up to around about 400, 450 points. Plus, of course, the fact that they're connected now to the internet. It's now EU law that if we ship cars, they have to have internet connectivity. Did you know that? No? Fact. So next time you're in the market for a car, allegedly that is one of the things we now look for. Okay, so there's our car. And we're going to use just three sensors in it. Um, we're going to know what the tire pressure is, whether it's occupied and being driven, and what speed. From the three sensors, if we get a report from the sensor on tire pressure that says the pressure is going down, we're not moving and there's no one in the driver's seat. It's a null event. Until someone gets in the driver's seat and turns on the ignition, we don't want to know. On the other hand, if we get the report that the pressure is going down in the tire very gently and we're doing um, 30 miles an hour, uh, 45 kilometers an hour, um, the driver is going to get an alert. They're going to get told they have a tire pressure dropping. They'll probably be showing the tire pressure, etc. Change that round and have almost total loss in a very short period of time, doing 70 miles an hour, the reactions will be very different. At that point, you'll start to do things like pull the seatbelt down, turn off the fuel supply in the event of a crash, even adjust the braking. That's where the value comes out of IoT systems. The ability to get an outcome from the sensors that wouldn't have been present in a standard process. And that means you can now see back how you want to use data. Now, that's a very simplistic example I've given you, but it gets the point across that says we don't use data in a procedural way. We have events that cause us to decide on a chain of reactions. From that chain of reactions, we want a data model. So let's go into a slightly bigger picture. I mentioned earlier that we have a slight problem about um, people recognizing what's happening. Really, in our brave new world of IoT, there are two or three worlds actually colliding. Um, if we do this one around buildings for a moment, and we start with the picture of the building on one side and industrial automation, then that's a pretty well-developed science. So Johnson Controls, Honeywell, or anybody else who does buildings, they have systems which read and respond. I always think of them as a reflex. Temperature goes down, heating goes on. Great. Well, I've just said that we have a lot more ways of now knowing what is that interaction, why is it happening. But we also have this challenge that says uh, we need to do something about it. Um, we need to make something happen. That's where we kick off smart services. So Uber, if you like, you're in the building type situation. You say something's happened. Uber then picks up all those things, puts them together, and decides what's the nearest car that meets your requirement. But they also have to do something else from the far side. They also have to process your credit card. They also will take in feeds, so IBM will give them the weather forecast. They'll decide whether to jack the price up if it's raining. They'll pull in event data, something bigs on, and therefore there'll be a bigger demand over there in this area, et cetera. So what we've actually got now is something quite complicated because we've got three different time zones across which an activity can happen. And quite clearly, you'll recognize that we also have Somewhere over on that side, we have traditional big data analytics and traditional databases, but we don't want to use them in quite the way we did to support the middle zone of relatively real-time reaction and smart services in response to events and things that happen in the first zone. So architecturally, IoT starts to introduce a very different set of architectures onto the kind of systems we get. And the assumption in that is one architecture? Don't think so. What's probably going to happen is a lot of different service companies are going to be in the middle box, and a lot of different sources are going to be on the other side, etc. So one of the challenges in this is you might be able to figure out a data model for your, your part of that, but it doesn't work very well because the reality is 
as all the devices and the value is created by the interaction and the serendipitous capability that follows, you need to hold the data in a way that will go with that. Not very good to try and do it in conventional ways. So if we take that building and go a bit further and start looking at what do you want to store? Uh, the picture here takes an air conditioning unit and there are five basic ways you can decide I need to say something about this. You can see the five up there. I don't know if you can read from the back. Location, description, so we need to know where it is in the building um, or physically out on the street. We need a device description. What model number is it? What type is it um, for service purposes? We need to know the customer. Who is it we're working on? Who owns it? What do they do with it? The network it's attached to, because uh, many IoT expert networks are not traditional IT networks. They'll be on um, something like Zigbee or something, a low power network. And you need to know if there's any permission about who can have what. So you have a series of dimensions again. Very familiar, I would think, to all of you, since you're working in this area. But you can see how well now it fits us to create a profile of a device in a way that now allows us to exploit the kind of dimensions you're used to experiencing. So, what happens when we get bigger and bigger? Why do we want this? What does it give us that's different? It gives us a shift from what I would call web-based process into this smart service analytics model. Um, there's two examples up there which are quite popular, one of which I'm going to explore in a bit more detail, which is smart farming and what's happened to it. So I'm going to take the preventative maintenance one. Um, if you do maintenance today, then you do it by having a plan. And that says every six months you visit this unit, you do certain service work on it, etc. If it goes down in between, then you have to panic react. The classic story of this, which is absolutely true, uh, involves a particular heat pump, um, and not a million miles from here either, in Canary Wharf. Uh, it failed, an engineer went and rebuilt it uh, on site. They're not terribly complicated. Piston ring had cracked, and uh, that was the failure. So service it, stripped it, rebuilt it, all the rings, well, he was about it, did the bearings, etc., put it back into service. Approximately nine weeks later, another service engineer responded to the routine service pattern and took it all apart again and did exactly the same replacement of wearing parts and put it back into service. Plan or reaction? The whole business case about IoT is that we shift into reactive. We respond to events with an optimized capability rather than a theoretical capability. So production planning, you start to actually try and, and work in with what is happening on the floor, not have a disconnect and a report back later. So at this point, you'll realize that traditional analytics reporting of what has happened, shall we improve it, shall we improve the process, actually changes. Yes, you want to do that because you've got to have some idea of life and direction and happening, but a lot more of it starts to become reactive. From those reactions, then a certain amount of analysis does improve your rules, so it's an ever-improving circle if it's created the right way. That's why the interest. There is actually a very genuine business case, way, way beyond the fact that the towel dispenser is empty or some other stupid one that you've probably all heard of as well. So, real gains in that. What kind of gains? Preventative maintenance, it's broadly thought that the minimum level of uh, improvement is about 30%. Some areas it's thought to be a lot higher. But we also are moving into some other areas. Um, I use the farming one because it usually surprises everyone that um, the farming or agri in industry has done this so fast and so well. Um, I have actually asked why and how to uh, someone at John Deere, and he thought about it for a long time, and his reply was, because they don't have an IT department. Now, actually, what he was actually trying to say was that they were freer 
to make moves because they didn't have a lot of legacy that they had to consider as well. So don't take it too far out of context. It's a great joke, but actually that's what he really meant. There wasn't a legacy problem. There is a history up there, but basically what's happening now is that the John Deere equipment uh, in passing a field is measuring lots of things. So it actually knows how fertile, how dry, what the temperature is, a lot of stuff. And they build a picture of a farm and the local agribusiness, which is very well developed to do this in uh, the US, now works on that basis. So they decide on a planting pattern and there's a constant variability as the tractor goes across the field as to how much seed it puts in, how much fertilizer it puts in. Not surprisingly, it's called precision farming because they are now getting levels of precision about how they apply resources that they didn't have before. But more importantly, it's a bloody great data exchange. Everybody's got their finger in the data exchange of how they make this work. And that's, again, the other principle that comes out of IoT. It's not just me, it's me and, and my company and, and my industry and. There's a similar example I can take you through in the railway industry in North America behind General Electric's predicts where they are managing whole railway companies now and controlling the movements of the trains and doing all sorts of stuff. When you start thinking about it that way, you start realizing why there is excitement that connecting things together is going to take us to another level. But the value has changed. If you went back a year ago, everybody wanted to talk about sensors. Look at the smart design of this sensor, look at that. Today, for those of you who are connected, if you want to try it, we've got a new term which is just really coming in now. The analysis of things, or AOT. If you look up AOT, you might be surprised, you'll see some pretty decent names behind it. Uh, Teradata, SAS, IBM, pretty well all the people you'd expect. Why? Because as we get more sensors and we do more things like this, the whole challenge shifts. And it's not about sensing, it's actually about what you do with the data from the sensors. So we stop talking at one end of the model and we start talking about the other. And this end of the model is where we start to hear all the terms you've heard. So we start with complex event processing. One beyond that is cognate cognitive reckoning, which is what Watson is. Beyond that, there is whatever you like to think AI may or may not represent in the longer term. But there is one thing about all of those changes. All of those changes rely on the fact that there is a continual interaction. There is no fixed model. You interact around what is needed, when it is needed, how it is needed. Event causes the chain. We move away. And that's my case for why more, over a year ago I started to say to people, the IoT revolution is a revolution that depends totally on graph. It's simply not a feasible answer to go beyond piloting with anything else. It has to be graph. So when we look at what's happening, we can see a kind of chain across. Um, at the moment, we've got a kind of massive ad hoc uh, move going into the way that we will then start to use data. So piloting and models, pilots, in my view, should be done in a manner that will lead forward. One of the other big cases of graph in this is the experience that's already been gained about fraud. If you think about all the connections and you think about a smart city and interactions or even the farm one, one of the problems you've got in it is who told me that and is it right? So you actually become very fixated on the authentication of the quality of the data. Um, you can handle it a number of ways but if you think about it, it's a bit like buying stuff on eBay and looking at the rating for the company you're buying from.
that is beginning to become one of the issues, along with some other stuff, etc. So there's a number of things already underway with the work that's already been done with uh, Neo 4J de deployments that help. So if we add all that together, the future is about more data that looks more like some of the stuff you're already working on, but this time it's coming from things and you're going to want to blend that with everything else. Now I've just managed to leave slightly under five minutes for a few questions. And that, by the way, is quite a lot to take in in one go. Um, if you are interested in this subject, uh, then tomorrow my blog is actually all about the rise of AOT and why. And uh, if you just Google my name and Constellation Research and blog, you'll find me fairly quickly. <laughs>